Hello, friends, and welcome to Boston.com's Cocktail Club. I'm Jackson Cannon, and soon I'll be joined by Nick O'Connell of Post Road Liquors in Wayland, Mass. Tonight, we're making cocktails with gin, catching up on the local bar restaurant community, and of course, sharing some tips the pros use to make great drinks at home. First, I'm going to go through everything you need for tonight's session. If you click through to Gordon's Wine and Spirits when you registered and purchased the Boston.com Gin Cocktail Kit, well, you have almost everything you need. Profits from those kits go to Off Their Plate. This is a great charity that buys meals from restaurants that need the business and delivers them to frontline line workers and others in need. Um, also tonight, we've got a great playlist of local music by the team at Hereby. Uh, so we can make this a little bit more of a party tonight. The drinks we're going to be making are the Tom Collins and the classic Negroni. Um, and all the while, of course, we'll be taking your questions from the chat. The ingredients that you're going to need for tonight's uh, session, you know, you're going to need some gin. Um, you know, I'm going to use this Ford's gin. I love this stuff. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's a London dry style, which I really like for the cocktails that we're making. Um, but there are so many good gins. There's Beef Eater and Tangeray. Um, boy, there's Bombay, both the, both the original and the Sapphire, Hendrix, Bar Hills, another favorite of mine, Plymouth. The list just goes on. And it occurs to me, if you had as many good friends as there are great gins in the world, well, you would be blessed indeed. All right, now, I did want to get to one other question for the few of us that uh, aren't into gin that are on the call tonight. You can absolutely sub vodka in these two cocktails and you'll be making a classic variation that's delicious. Um, besides the gin, you're going to need some simple syrup, uh, a little lemon juice and some lemons that we're going to slice for garnish. You'll need vermouth, um, the red variety that's sweet vermouth or uh, Italian. Um, and of course, you'll need Campari and some orange for garnish in that Negroni as well. Glassware, highly recommend a classic Collins glass or something else that's vaulted like this um, to really focus the carbonation of the Collins in the glass. Uh, we like something tall and narrow. A regular highball or, um, or something more like a little juice glass also works really nice for a fizz like this. So um, you can use either of those. Then for the Negroni, you know, it's your basic choice, right? Um, I love it on the rocks, slice of orange right in there. Um, but if you like to kind of regard that drink and sip it and not have that evolution that takes place while it's on ice, um, you may want to use a cocktail glass or a coupe glass um, so that you can kind of have that drink uh, just photographed in that way for yourself. Uh, you'll need ice, of course, as well. Um, you know, we uh, are going to be shaking tonight. Uh, so you'll need some kind of cocktail shaker set. Um, if you don't have that, a little Tupperware can stand in and really help you out there. A mixing glass, if you have that, to stir um, and pour your Negroni that way. Um, if you don't have that, you can absolutely mount a Negroni over ice and stir it right in the glass if that's the way you're going to roll. Um, you probably need a, a strainer, probably a Hawthorne strainer to go with your shaker set. And... Um, you'll need to measure. We're gonna use, uh, I, I like these jiggers that we use in the bar. Compound measurements make it really easy for us to build a lot of rounds. Here in the home, you can use a tablespoon set. And just remember that a tablespoon is half an ounce. Um, so if the drink calls for an ounce and a half, that's three tablespoons, really easy to make that conversion. Uh, you'll need to make a little juice. I squeezed mine a, a few minutes ago with this quality juicer. You can use a reamer, or if you have to, just cut it up in pieces and squeeze it with your fingers and collect it up that way, and, and in it goes. Um, you know, we're going to use Sweet Vermouth, the Classic, and the Negroni. Taking a question from the chat in the setup, um, can you use dry vermouth? Absolutely. Both vermouths are sweet. One is less than the other. The dry and sweet aspect of that is something to be explored, not abhorred. Um, so absolutely express yourself. There is numerous named variations off the endless string of things that you can do off that durable three ingredient cocktail. Um, let's see, got a cutting board and a knife for garnish. We've got a little plate out here and I think that pretty much sets the stage. That's everything I need to get, uh, to get going on these couple of drinks. My friend Nick O'Connell is a fine wine specialist at his family store, Post Road Liquors in Wayman, in Wayland, Mass. 
Uh, he's a rare wine collector, a South Boston resident, and has been a tireless advocate for great bars, restaurants, and bartenders throughout the region. He's known for his rare wit, uh, read sarcastic sense of humor, yep, and his passion uh, for looking at things from an unusual perspective. It's that latter trait uh, that drove him to establish cast force barrel-aged maple syrups and to promote the Tagroni, a freewheeling view of the classic gin cocktail, the Negroni. He's asked that we uh, put out the tip jar for off their plate to help our charity get to their fundraising goal. I can speak from experience when I say he is an excellent bar guest, a pretty darn good bartender himself, a gin enthusiast and a friend. Welcome, Nick, good to see you, buddy. Thanks, Jackson, good to be on the same side of the bar as you. I'm so happy we get to make drinks, even though it's uh, we have to drink our own instead of each other's. I know. Thank you for giving me the layup of a Tom Collins. Taking it easy on me here. Uh, well, before we get to that, how's uh, how's it going out there on the street? Like, what's what's happening in your favorite bars? You know, it's good. You know, I mean, my friend just opened up a new bar in Boston called Offsuit. It's in the back of one of my favorite restaurants, Troquet on South. Um, love going there. My girlfriend and I go, it feels very safe. Uh, they only take 25% capacity or 20% capacity, whatever it is, but it's definitely, you know, a really nice speakeasy vibe. Um, so we've been loving that. We've been cooking in and just relaxing. Awesome. Well, you told me, uh, earlier that you've been doing something else kind of sweet and you might be too shy to say it yourself, but you've been buying gift cards for when restaurants do reopen and uh, we can all be sitting out there on the patios together. That's a really cool move, man. Much appreciated in the industry. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're, we're gonna see each other on the patio anyways, all summer long when things open up a little bit. So just to like give everybody a little extra goose and pay for a few uh, summer dinners in advance. I mean, it just seems like the right thing to do. It's like a smart savings account. You're investing in those restaurants being there for you when you are ready to enjoy them. Should we uh, dive in on a, Get a Collins. I'm getting thirsty. I don't know about you. Let's do it, please. That sounds great. Um, all right. So I am going to uh, use this terrific Ford's gin, and I'm doing a two to one to one relationship. Um, so an ounce and a half of gin or three tablespoons, if that's how you're measuring. Um, three quarters of an ounce each of simple syrup and fresh squeezed lemon juice. And like syrup is a, is a, it's a real simple one-to-one, -one. you know, I, um, I make mine on a low heat just because I like the texture that produces, but somebody was asking me, do you need to boil it? They use super fine sugar themselves and it just goes right into the water and you absolutely do not, you, you probably never should actually boil it because it kind of breaks up the strands and makes that sort of weaker, thinner version of it. If you just get enough heat on it to like gently move it around and get it, get it going like that, it's the best way to make it at home. Um, I pulled this glass out of uh, the freezer before we got started. I'm going to load my ice into it. I, um, I think this drink is a really important one to focus on keeping everything cold. You know, it's cold glass, you know, obviously your ice. Um, if your simple syrup and lemon juice can, can be like a little bit uh, chilled, that's great. Most importantly, that your soda water be very, very, very cold. Um, and that just... Uh, gives you better carbonation in the drink and it lasts longer. Lots of questions about why we shake and stir and you know, you've been with us here for a couple of weeks. Nice, smooth, buddy, looking good. Um, you know that we like to, to get some, besides getting the ingredients put together and uh, some dilution and obviously the temperature brought down everything incorporated. We like to get a little bit of air uh, into the citrus things because it lightens it up and livelies it up. Okay, and before I add my soda, I'm just gonna pull out a lemon. I'm gonna do a few half moons the way we like to. It's pretty easy way if you have modest knife skills. You just kind of take the top off Stand it up, come down the side there. And 
I'll sort of trim it to get it straight. And then you can just pull these really Now, Jackson, easy. is that the Jackson Cannon bar knife? Um, guilty, yes, it is. One of, my, this, one, of the, one of the saw blade ones, it's kind of really nice for this move. Now, gonna top it up. Uh, with ice cold soda water. Ooh, that's looking, it's making me very thirsty, Nick. Lots of Zoom calls today, getting ready for that first gin drink. And then I'm just gonna garnish with a couple of these slices of lemon right in the side. And cheers to you, buddy. Cheers, man, thank you. Awesome, now that's a great glass, what's that? So this is actually a Zalto beer glass. Um, didn't, couldn't find a highball in my apartment, so these are actually uh, really thin, thin, thin beer glasses that would shatter immediately almost seven nights a week. Yeah, well, some of the advantages of going one drink at a time. I'm Definitely. always amazed at how kind of like spicy this drink is with a good gin, you know? Um, sparkling, refreshing, obviously, like like a, a grown-up's lemonade, but you really get the botanicals of the gin come out. Do you, what, so what did you use? Would you have a favorite brand that you like to use? So one of my favorite London dries is this number three gin. Um, mm -hmm. It's Berry Brothers and Rudd, um, classic retailer and importer in London. Um, and I just absolutely love the profile on it. It lets the other ingredients speak. Um, and it's got a nice kind of peppery finish to it. So well, that's fun. You know, like you're like, like me that you like the lean kind of mean machine aspect of London dry in this drink. You know, it, it, it bears mentioning that the drink was originated with old Tom gin, um, a great gin for mixing that was kind of lost from our palate while I was learning to make drinks. Um, but has come back now. Um, and that just, that does provide a little bit more texture to the drink, but I feel like it loses a touch of that juniper punch that I like so much. Um, so that's why I have a preference, but that's why, you know, we all uh, get to seek out our preferences in terms of the expressions of brands. Somebody asked me on the chat just now, if we knew about uh, Tomcat gin from Caledonia Spirits. Of and, course. Um, you know, like that's a that's a great barrel aged gin. Now, uh, it's a play off of using Tom from Old Tom, but it's not really an Old Tom gin, right? It's a it's a it's like a, an austere New American botanical gin that's barrel aged. So I, I would think less for a Collins and with a gin like that, and more stirred drinks like Negronis and and and, and the like, or like a, the Attention or something like that. But that's just me. Yeah, um, I was. Enough to get a, uh, a bottle of the Monkey 47 Distillers Edition this year. And that was actually aged in uh, Mizanara casks. So yeah. it's amazing how much that oak really just gives it so much more body. Yeah. Yeah, I find those, the, the Woody Gins are really fascinating to regard. I haven't yet like found the, the tonic combination that works. So if you're like a gin tonic sort, they're probably not as fun to explore. But if you like the Martinez, you know, the attention, like I find those, those gins to be this really interesting marriage of sort of the finishing tones of whiskey with the, you know, that blast and, and heart of juniper and gin, it's kind of fun. What are some other cool brands that you've seen recently? Uh, in terms of tonic, I absolutely love the uh, 1724 tonic. Um, and speaking to your point that you just made, I, uh, I actually like thinning it out a little bit with like Saratoga sparkling water. Um, Fascinating. Kind of allowing the gin to kind of amplify the cocktail a little bit more um, and not get overwhelmed by the, the, uh, the tonic quinine and everything. But, yeah, no, it's, it's, well, it's so interesting too. Like when you think of water like that as an ingredient, sometimes a little more water helps you taste things um, that you might not have gotten before. You know, you just sort of, you seize up. Um, that's cool. 
Oh, I'm digging this Collins, but I'm already thinking about making some Negronis. I don't know about you. Let's do it. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Take take me through. Take us through this. Uh, how you like to do it? Yeah. So I uh, I have a rocks glass here. This was a gift from my brother. Um, really nice. Also, shockingly thin. I've already broken one of them, but. <laughs> Um, I think these are the water glasses at the Baldwin bar. Um, he was sitting there and he had an epiphany over how it would be such a good Negroni glass. But um, I just filled the glass up about three quarters of the way with ice. Um, if you have an ice sphere, that works perfectly too. Um, but I'm gonna start with a mixing glass with ice in it. And I actually just got Brookline ice from down the street. I haven't made my own ice in a long time due to lack of freezer space, but um, I'm going to be using Citadel gin tonight. Uh, this is an excellent uh, French gin. Um, and before I just eyeball this, we're going to do, I'm doing a big Negroni. I'm doing an ounce and a half. Love it. Thanks. I usually put the gin on the bottom if I'm building it in the glass, but if you do have a mixing glass, obviously it doesn't matter. Um, ounce and a half of Campari. And then for sweet vermouth, I think that has just as much of an impact on the cocktail as the gin. And uh, I love using this Koki Vermouth de Torino. Um, Learned it from you, Jackson, at the Hawthorne. Uh, absolutely choice. Love, love, love how mild and just the little bit of cola notes that you get from it. And so I don't know if you want to speak to uh, why you stir it versus shake it, Jackson, but I'm pretty sure you shake anything with citrus, and if it has sweet vermouth in it, you just stir it, correct? Well, so, um, yeah, we shake things with citrus or egg, um, and we stir things that have, like, clear ingredients, and, uh, you know, um, that's the most basic cleave between the two things. The, um, the thing is to remember why. And it's to get this lemon juice activated, to get that egg white frost, all those things, to get that espresso martini, you know, into that texture range where you have either like, you know, a fizz at the top or a foam with a, with a drink coming behind it. And in these clear spirit based drinks, we want this velvety silky texture. I can see it pouring like a ribbon right out of your, uh, vessel there into the glass, right? Um, that's just more pleasant on our palate and allows us to taste the drink better. This idea, like, can you bruise the gin by shaking it in a martini? Well, you know, if you do shake it on ice, it, it can cloud up a little bit, it can loosh. And so that was kind of romantically called a bruise. No, you don't really bruise the gin, but it's just a, a visual cue that you haven't made the drink in the most appealing way. Um, you know, like I, we have one question saying, did, was Tucci wrong? You know, like, and yeah, Stanley was wrong in how you make that drink. And now he's trading on the, on the promos for his new show about Italy, about how he broke the internet with, uh, with, uh, by making that cocktail the wrong way and offending everybody. I don't really care about that. You know, like if you do shake the drink, it's pretty damn durable and it'll come back to ground, you know? Um, but there, there is a reason that we do these things. And that it, those are the reasons. Um, and then at a certain point, they just kind of become a marker uh, for better technique. You know, when you sit at a great bar and look across um, at uh, a bartender with a good stir, which is, you know, kind of harder than it looks. It's, I think it's a life skill, like sewing a button, searing a steak, and, you know, you, that everybody should know how to do it, right? But, you know, it takes a little while to learn how to do it that way. Um, the funny thing about this drink, the irony, right? I mean, it is, it, it, it's, it occupies so much space. You could not like the three things in this drink 
and still like the flavor of this drink, they come together and they become something else, you know? And it's like, how's that possible? And you can put an ounce and a half of gin and an ounce each of the other ingredients. And guess what? It's flipping delicious. You know, you can mess up a couple yeah. of parts of this whole thing, right? And it still works. So we call that durable. Um, so it's simple. It's a profound set of flavors, but it's actually, you know, a little bit dur durable to your, your mishandling of it, which I think is one of the reasons actually the drink is so popular because it's, it's, it's very complex to drink, but it's very simple to make. Absolutely. And a quick shout out to Boston Shaker. I got this uh, mixing glass there years ago from a local artist. Uh, and I know I've seen your bar knife there too, Jackson. Uh, that's, that's an excellent shop over in Somerville. Uh, yeah. And they've got a good, they've got a, you know, they've got a good in-person game. Um, and they've also got, uh, they've also got um, a, uh, a good website. So you can get stuff off their site too, if you don't feel like ready to go in there quite yet. So I'm doing yeah. little slices of orange in mine. I saw you do the twist. Um, but and that's there we go. Spoon right there. Cheers, buddy. I missed those. Yeah, speaking of messing up this drink, I um, I actually started doing this thing called the Tigroni, which hey, is hold that parts. hold that thought for one second. Yeah, I want I want I want you to show people how to do that on the way out. Um, but while we were moving on to the Tigroni, some folks were asking us some more questions about the Collins and the drink itself, which I'd love to run a few of them by you and see if we can answer them. Yeah, Let's real quick. Um, the, uh, have you ever heard of adding egg white on a Tom Collins? Uh, my good friend who's a bartender at Sorolina told me that's how you do a traditional Collins. Uh, I haven't heard that, um, but I'm sure you could easily implement that and have it taste delicious with that nice froth on top. It's delightful. One time, a friend of mine from uh, drink, my greatest bar, oh, <laughs> scatter my ashes, should I fall, place on earth, wonderful bar drink. Um, they sent me a picture of this bill and it was like every classic sour you ever heard of. Jack Rose, add egg white. It was the, the red, the print, the printout, you know, Corpse Survivor number two, add egg white. And some guests were like, wow, this egg white's really nice in this drink. What else is it good in? And they're like, I don't know. And they're like, can you try it in this? Can you try it in that? And so they had basically like a party had sat there and proved that a, an egg white is a fine addition to just about every sour and fizz there is. So um, don't be afraid. If you're into that, go for it. Why not? Um, do you want to speak to why you put the gin first in the glass when you're doing a straight mount in the glass? That's a really good point. Yeah, so that's what I was going to get to, actually, and I got sidetracked with the Tigroni, but uh, I actually, when I make them at home, I'm so sick, despite my article, I'm so sick of one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one Negronis that I actually just kind of eyeball it, uh, and depending on the gin, you know, I usually do about an ounce and a half, two ounces of gin, uh, and then, you know, probably about an ounce to an ounce and a quarter of Campari, and then usually around 0.75 to a full ounce of vermouth, depending on the vermouth, how rich it is. Um, and, you know, messing around with that and having like mistake Negronis uh, is what I hated when I would go to a bar and they would make the Negroni wrong. But at home, you're kind of freewheeling it. And it's, it's more fun that way, I think. You get different flavor profiles every time. Well, that's cool. The uh, We're getting some questions about can I sub Campari and such? And some questions about Campari itself. We're going to drop a little link to an article about kind of really what Campari is because it would take the whole time we have to, to go into that for those of you who want to find out a little bit more information. But what, um, what are some, uh, you know, beyond the obvious, Aperol is a little softer presentation of some of the same notes. And I love that on a summer day. Um, I also like doing that if I'm going to like dry vermouth and maybe vodka and those Contessa strains of the Negroni. Um, but what are some other bitters that you like to put in place of the Campari? I absolutely love Campari Negronis. I think that's, you know, about 95% of the time I just crave that Campari flavor. But 
Uh, this Contrado Bitter. Yeah. Um, one of the older companies in the world. My family and I actually visited Contrado and saw the wine caves and everything. Um, but it's just not as pungently bitter. Um, it's a little bit more of like a kind of popsicle complexity, similar, similar to Aperol, but it just, it doesn't have that abruptly bitter finish to it that I look for. Um, do you get people looking for different kinds of gin in the store? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, our gin well, people get, when they get confused by the, the different styles, what's a, is there an easy way that you break it down for folks like to try and figure out, Hey, should I try London dry or should I try new American? Should I be in a French style? I think it's pretty easy to bounce around from gin to gin. Like, you know, generally if people like the viscosity of Bar Hill that has that honey in it that you mentioned, they'd probably like Nolets, uh, which actually is the family that started Kettle One, one of the oldest uh, distilleries in the world. Um, I think that's got a little bit of like a sunblock complexity to it. So there's all these weird flavors and botanicals that, you know, some people can get turned on by them. Other people just absolutely can't stand them. And I feel like it's, it's all a trial and error thing with gins. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, a rewarding trial. No question. Yeah. <laughs> no question. <laughs> um, a, uh, people asking about shape of ice, style of ice, and stuff like that. Well, um, you know, it's pretty easy to get good solid home ice um, if you have space in the freezer. Um, yeah. The... Uh, <laughs> You know, it's, it's got to fight. It's got to fight for room. Um, but uh, I, I wanted us to drop in the chat. You and I were talking a little bit about uh, our friend Camper English, and he has kind of figured out everything there is to know about making ice at home. Um, so we'll drop a little link into his article on um, on all the different molds that you could possibly buy. Again, I stand by my target select. You know, simple little. It's odd that it's 15 cubes. That actually really kind of messes with my head because I need 16, but that's, you know, that's a problem <laughs> for another day. It's a topic for another day. Um, just checking the chat a little bit more. Uh, well, you know, while we've got some time, I am sort of, I was su not surprised that it was you, but I was happy to find that this Tigroni thing that had been kind of kicking around on the internet. Actually, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't, I don't know what you claim in terms of origin, but you certainly are its most outspoken proponent. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got on that vibe and what that means to you and how do, how do we get some? Yeah, totally. I mean, Negroni has always been uh, one of my favorite drinks. We've been bottling a bottle aging them for years, my brother and I. Um, and so one day he called me and said that Campari makes a 50 ml uh, nip. And so immediately I got right online and looked for the highest end gin and sweet vermouth available in that format. Um, to my knowledge, I don't think anybody has done it before. The term Tigroni uh, certainly, you know, has been a, you know, to go cocktail staple for years. But in terms of the triple barrel format, that's a, uh, you know, taped together, just bootleg with 3M packing tape. I don't think anybody's ever done that, but it's- I'm never uh, going to a tailgate without this setup again. Show, show us, would you? Yeah, so I mean, the golf bag, the, uh, you know, purse, whatever you guys want to carry these things in, they're absolutely perfect. And, uh, you know, as you and I were building that perfect Negroni, you know, we could have made about 50 <laughs> Uh, and you know, it's perfect every time. Uh, and you know, you just need to add a garnish, but, uh, we've been doing them all around Boston in quarantine and enjoying them. You know, it's not easy to get a Negroni everywhere. So we're trying to start the movement of Negronis. Anyway. That is, that is just terrific. People should follow and, and, uh, and like your posts on Instagram for the Negroni and they should get involved themselves. Um, I don't think I'm ever going to a tailgate without that uh, set up like six or seven of those in the, in the back of the car again. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I wanna highlight again that you're at uh, Post Road Liquors in Wayland. 
people who want to come in and talk more gin with you. If they're uh, in another part of the city and they're closer to our friends at Gordon's too, they know a little thing or two about gin. Totally. Um, they can, you know, and it's, uh, it's, I think to start the conversation with anybody um, when they walk into you and they say like, Hey, I like X, what should I try next? I think for me has always been a really like a positive way to get people into a variety of cocktails and, and also into a variety of brands. And I know that's something you practice really well. So hopefully people can come in and, uh, and explore your selection, you know, so. Absolutely. I appreciate the plug. I really do. No, I'm and, uh, really, really glad to have you here. It's great to have a drink with you. Uh, I'm really psyched you could spend this time and thanks to everybody else for, uh, for joining us. That's um, pretty much all we have time for cocktail club this week. Uh, hope you can join us again every Thursday at 7 PM. Next week guest is Alexis Sullivan and we'll be making a couple of glasses um, of whiskey drinks, including crazy whiskey smash pictured there. Uh, make sure to follow the link from our sign-in page to Gordon's Wine and Spirits to pick up the boston.com bourbon cocktail kit. You'll be supporting off their plate, getting everything you need for next week's boston.com cocktail club. Hey, Nick, thanks a lot, man. Jackson, really great pleasure. having you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Bye, friends. Thank you all.